<laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the esports show. I'm just having a bit of a laugh because Ferg can't stop making me laugh all day today. My name's Judge. We've got Ferg on the desk with us as our special guest this week. Tibor on the end, as always. Uh, Ferg, how are you doing today, man? You've been down here for a while. Yeah, look, I mean, we arrived uh, yesterday, but um, we've got a, a bit of a lengthy journey ahead of us. Um, another five days in uh, Adelaide and then off to South Korea. Uh, so where we'll be ta taking part in the uh, Asia Minor, which we've been um, gracefully invited to, uh, contrary to a little bit of, you know, <laughs> a little bit of, a little bit of Twitter beef. Yeah, a bit of, yeah, a bit of beef. But you know, it's, it's life happens. Um, and then uh, back here again. So this is home for the next few weeks, really. Heck yeah. Um, but yeah, great, great to be here, and thanks for having me on the show, guys. It's going to be a good yeah. show, Lewis. We've got a whole heap to talk about this week um as every week although i won't be reading stories on the show tonight we can do no? that later no i thought like maybe i don't know like a sunday twitch stream or something just yeah, story could. time with judge thanks to nightfall for that idea by the way yeah you certainly could well it, it, uh, wasn't it your wife that bought that book for my daughter yes yeah yeah we sure did we bought that for daughter's birthday i think it was uh no it was like um maybe like baby shower baby that's what it was yeah <laughs> And we, we just thought it was perfect. It worked too. Yeah. Did it really? It actually worked. <laughs> like just full book, just it took, just take some time. Full book. The whole book though. Can't yep. be a little bit. It's got to be the full book. And then I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> She's got great taste in, liter in literature. But uh, tonight, not only do we have a, a special guest on the show, we actually have a live studio audience. Um, if your audience can give us a shout. Woo! Yay! <laughs> audience. It, look, this is, this is real esports content right here guys <laughs> i want to start off the the talk this week by talking about the microsoft intellimouse it's coming back Woo! Woo! now you were more excited about it than me i but... was so excited <laughs> were, you, were you keen on this first yeah look i mean it's great to see that uh it's reinvigorated itself and um sort of resurfaced but it's been a while uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a long, a long time coming i mean i think there's a bit of marketing pr prowess behind that whole strategy but uh, it's good to see that it's coming back. I know that there's oh, yeah. a couple of fans upstairs right now who are pracking that definitely will be getting their hands on those when they come back out into stock. Yeah, man, Microsoft playing the long PR game is, is basically <laughs> what they've done here. Uh, <laughs> I just, when is it being released? Uh, soon. TM. Soon. Yeah, <laughs> soon. TM. Soon. But it will be, when it's released, it'll be available for $39.99. Uh, I, I, I pulled an excerpt of what Microsoft have, have said on their official website about this. The features that fans loved about the original are still there. Customizable buttons, the classic ergonomic look and feel, and the wired USB connection. Upgrades made possible by today's technology can help you, uh, can help you find your breakthrough. Tracking is more precise, buttons feel more reliable, and the tail light is a distinctive modern white. <laughs> but is it aerodynamic? Absolutely. <laughs> it is absolutely aerodynamic for the highest FPS you can get out of a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Useful. <laughs> Very useful, and we'll expect to see it at every single national LAN coming soon. Uh, <laughs> memes aside, we do have good announcements coming through. StarCraft 2 uh, have their Blizzard ANZ Cup number 5. Um, we haven't really touched on StarCraft so much in the four weeks now, fifth week that we've had the show. No, not at all. No, we haven't. But uh, we got al alerted to this mm -hmm. um, and, and thought we'd give it a bit of a plug because this Saturday at 11, is the fifth cup these are actually qualifiers for the world series so uh, it's a world championship series the top placing player from anz qualifiers will qualify for the world championship series 2017 premier league uh, while also sharing in the local 10 grand usd seasonal prize pool so every cup has one grand on it and this 10 of those obviously playing into the ten thousand dollar prize pool um wcs has a prize pool of over two million dollars globally uh, undeniably the biggest StarCraft 2 circuit to date for 2017. So big stuff happening in StarCraft. Blizzard's upping their game, getting the titles back in esports. Not, not bad for an apparent dying game. Yeah, well, that's what I heard recently is that, uh, you know, all the tournaments were pulling back on StarCraft. So I think in the IEM yep. scratched it yep. um, after their Shanghai recently, um, where, they, where they hosted the last one. But um, good to see the Blizzard's, you know, backing their games and not letting them die in the the that's it basically <laughs> yeah I mean, instead of just verge. plugging overwatch that's it and yeah. i mean we looked at it last week we talked about wow arena because an aussie team won the local is going to blizzcon uh, got picked up by blank esports who are massive in overwatch so mm -hmm. blizzard's doubling down on actually providing esports not just for their overwatch title but for a larger range of titles too which i'm impressed by hmm. yeah i think they still throw some stuff at heroes of the storm as well mm -hmm. sure do yeah. 
There's actually a lot of local support for Heroes Game Starters a lot with it. Blizzard's heavily involved in it. The, um, um, Discunker, he's all over it. He sure is. So credit to Blizzard um, doing good things with StarCraft 2. Um, and you know we'll, we'll keep our ear to the ground and, and see how things progress. But you can sign, they're open in the cups, aren't they? You can yes, sign up they are. They are open cups. You can play in every single one. So make sure you head over to the ESL Play website and sign up for this Saturday if you're an avid StarCraft 2 player. Get involved. Yep. This is one that you and I have been talking about a little bit, Tibor. World of Tanks is getting an ANZ server. It is. Uh, not a full-time server. No. But it is gonna, it is gonna well, drop ping during the six hour period of the day. So for those of you who aren't aware, World of Tanks, competitively played, Wargaming, uh, the company behind it, they have confirmed that ANZ will finally have their own server to play on launching on November 1st. World of Tanks has 130 million players worldwide. So it is what? actually, it, the P, <laughs> that's the PC community for World of Tanks. It's actually pretty big which is something that not a lot of people know. They see World of Tanks and think, ah, whatever, it's one of those crappy indie games. But it's, it, it's actually... Is that 95% Russian? Or? Well, wouldn't surprise me, and German. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but there is actually quite a big local scene here as well. Um, talking to, uh, this was Travis Plain, uh, Oz Gamers did an interview with him mm -hmm. regarding this whole announcement. And he said, a local server is the number one request from our community, and we are finally rolling them out on November 1st from 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time each day. It's a long time coming, but we hope that our players and the community can see that we're truly committed to investing in Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. So I think it's a good step. Better than not having a server, similar to PUBG. PUBG comes out, no OCE servers, and they say, okay, we'll give you OCE servers, and then they're slowly rolling out first person. Yep, got to do it in the end. Teasing us. Yeah, that's but, it. You know, it's, it's development. And that's Progress. the main thing. Move forward slowly but surely. And I mean, if the, if the World of Tanks community gets behind it, surely they'll extend that time period. Yeah, well, ESL Australia is running uh, the World of Tanks stuff for Asia out of Australia. Yeah, for APAC. <laughs> yep. Yeah. For, so, I mean, I, I suppose they shouldn't complain it, but it's going to be stupid pain. Yeah. And so there's a thing, new server. Let's, let's see if we can build this forward. Good on you, Wargaming. And let's see uh, World of Tanks increase in the future. This one... Next one rolls into something you briefly touched on, or we all briefly touched on last week. Uh, H1Z1 Invitational at TwitchCon. We talked about the H1Z1 Pro League and all of the amazing advances they're proposing yeah. for that. If you didn't watch that, listen, to last, or, listen or watch last week's uh, recording because the Pro League sounds amazing, especially with the protections they're bringing in for players. This, though, it's, it's more current. It's another Invitational going yeah. on now at TwitchCon, which is just about to start. Yeah, well, there's like three all up for like half a mil. Yeah, three competitions. So format, I, I looked into it. You've got the All-Stars, the Legends, and the Challengers. All-Stars, you've got 75 invited All-Star players from Twitch streamers to competitive players, the works. They're playing for a $200,000 prize pool with three matches. So 75 jump in, rinse and repeat three times. Winner overall is going to take home their share of 200K. Pretty big. Legends is pretty similar. 75 legendary players are going to come through, three matches, but that's for 250,000. That's more the pro scene version of it. So no Dr. Disrespect for that one. Legends, not so Wasn't much. Wasn't he good enough? <laughs> 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 he, he, was, he, he hit a 360 no-scope or something as well, didn't he? Yeah, he did. <laughs> On, it was pretty big. So, But Doc, I don't think will be invited to Legends. That's more your, your optics and stuff like that, Team Optic. But again, 250,000 increasing on that 200,000 often in the All-Stars, 75 of them, three matches. The interesting thing I like is challenges. So it's qualifiers over the course of TwitchCon that yep. you can get involved in, sign up, attend, and play. Share $50,000, 75 qualified players competing in it. it. And it literally could be anyone. That's the, the selling point on the site. What, what are your thoughts, Ferg, on, on events like this at, at cons where you can just rock up, play, and be involved in something massive? I think it's excellent for the community. Um, you know, especially... I'd, I'd assume that the developers obviously putting a lot of money behind yep. this. Um, and I think that's really the big sort of stance these days is developers backing their games in the competitive industry, which was not, a, not apparent for the past decade. Yeah. Um, so, and, and obviously, you know, you get your high tier sort of invite only leagues um, or events like sort of the PUBG, I suppose, for IEM mm. that's coming up. Um, <clears throat> but when you've got the chance for, you know, the general public to just rock up and, and be a part of it, it's, it's really something special. And I think that's, that's a great move for, uh, for H1Z1. 
absolutely. I mean, linking in with players and the player base and delivering things for them as a developer is something you and I talk about a lot, Lewis. It certainly is. And uh, well, H1Z1's already done really well at uh, marketing their product. I mean, they've got one of the top streams on television, uh, the top numbers with the King of the Kill. Yeah, that's right. So at the end of the day, the guys... Uh, behind H1Z1 are really thinking about how they mm. push this forward and, mm -hmm. and how they look to the future for their game. I think having not just the pro scene, but helping out the casual gamer is the, the way to do it. People say that esports exists as a marketing tool to sell in-game skins and, and to, to create numbers in microtransactions. Fair enough, in stuff like League of Legends, that's true. Same with CS with Valve and Cases. Of course. But getting the players involved in that top tier and that competition kind of thing yeah. and saying, you know what, you're a casual gamer, rock up the TwitchCon and have a bloody go, I, I support that 100%. Oh, yeah. definitely. One thing definitely. I wanted to, uh, and, and Lewis, you brought this up. Uh, so anyone heading to H1Z1 uh, Invitational at TwitchCon, good luck. And uh, let us know your thoughts. Let us know how you go there. Uh, tweet at us at the eSports show as well uh, with some results. We're going to keep an eye on it. But RLCS heading to Washington. Mm. Now, we were going to talk about this last week, but we didn't get the chance. This is the second time that RLCS has been in NA in a row. Yeah, so when, so RLCS Rocket League, uh, yep, World Champ Championships essentially, mm -hmm. for anyone who's not aware, uh, it's $400,000 this year going up. Wow. So that is not bad for Rocket League. I assume that's over all the um, regional championships. One would assume. Throwdown, etc. cetera. Um, however, um, yeah, the first one was in LA, mm -hmm. then they went to Amsterdam, then they went back to LA, now it's in Washington. Right. And a lot of uproar from the community about that, especially in EU. Of course. For a reasonable cause. I mean, looking at the results, so RCS won, uh, EU teams got second, third and fourth mm. out of eight. Right. So, uh, the second one, they got first, second and fifth. <laughs> and then in the third, they got first, second, fourth, and fifth. Right. So strong EU showing. Strong Teams EU do very, showing. very well. Yeah. Of course, they're complaining that they've got to go over to NA to compete. But surely well, it's there's more a reason. The fans mm. not being able to go as much. Okay. Now, I do. There is a lot of reasoning there behind it that I can see. They're putting it in the best time zone for views. Mm -hmm. And that's what's the most. Globally important. speaking, yeah. of course. Globally. Because. I mean, you look at OCE, we only bring about 150, 200 viewers. I mean, it really hasn't grown. A lot of work has to be still done in OCE to build the viewer base. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of tournaments and whatnot, but I mean, like if you get to 300 on a stream, it's like half an A. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, I mean, you look at Rocket League Central when they do streams in LA, uh, in NA, I should say, for their Rocket League competitions, yeah. not even RLCS affiliated stuff, just Rocket League Central comps. No. Or and they're uh, pushing 1K, 2K views, native. Yeah. So Pro Rivalry, uh, Pro Rivalry PRL? PRL. They, they do the same as well. Almost. Might I say as well, PRL, if any of the NA guys are watching, God damn, their mm. production is amazing. It is it is like the best sort of community based one if you can yeah if you can even call them that as yeah. an aside but yeah so comparatively when you look at native rocket league in our region esl puts on a competition like throwdown's a massive outlier like and i'm going to come right out here and say throwdown doesn't count because they're an international qualifier with massive backing from rlcs and hosting and everything else yeah but i mean before hosting they're still sitting at like 200 or under that's right and then they get the 70,000 host and then and then we've nice got 20 to 30k for the rest of the stream yeah of course that's a massive outlier but you look at esl you look at any of the community tournaments they're lucky to push 150 to 200 viewers yeah we would do like when we were doing every single rocket league community one just putting every night into free casts our stream was getting around 150 but that was like heaps of na that was all international yeah um we'd still have a lot of oce like maybe i'd say about 80 maybe half of that were OCE, but I mean, then half of it was international. So mm. we had to build up that branding around the international, but that's dropped off since um, it's had it's moved around different channels. And stuff. Yeah, that's right. So, um, but yeah, so OCE NA. doesn't bring much. So don't worry about OCE for views. Just <laughs> no. get that out of the way. The, the people that want to watch it are still going to watch it. That's right. Right. Mm. Um, but you put it in the middle of like the most middle you can for EU and NA, and then you've at least got the best time zone for each because LA's out for EU. Mm. EU's uh, backwards, so it's harder for um, NA to watch. So it's good for time zone, it's good for views, and that's what's going to drive Rocket League in the future, at least. I mean, yeah. the in-game tab saying uh, RSCS is live, 
boosted the numbers by I think like two hundred percent or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like they were which so, is, which yeah. is something I want to talk about maybe even next week uh, in talking about developers and mm-hmm. esports. We're going to touch on that later today as well. Um, but it's crazy the the involvement and, and the the payoff that having esports in your game client to make the layperson, the casual gamer aware yeah. is ridiculous. Oh, it, mm. It's absolutely crazy. But I think um, you're right. Washington's a good spot yeah. for it. It is a good spot. It is a different spot, but then for the fifth one, they're going to have to go back to EU. I mean, they've Just got... to be clear, is it Washington, D.C.? Or... Yeah, uh, yeah, Washington, D.C., okay. sorry. Okay, because um, I was thinking well, Seattle, yeah. Washington's... No, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's way over. That's in the L.A. time zone. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, yeah, no. yeah, Washington, D.C., around New York, for those unaware of the... Uh, NA geography. <laughs> yeah. Um, Basically, comparatively for our, for our local viewers, you've got no idea about the, like the kind Perth of layout. It's like Perth, yeah, Perth to yeah. Sydney in terms of layout there yeah. is the kind of difference in, in, in geolocation we're talking about. That's but true. look, I understand EU players complaining because, oh, it's in NA, like we thought it was our year this year, what's going on with this? I mm. get that because there's a passionate EU fan base that wants to join in. Huge. But there's also but, a bigger NA fan base. Even though EU is statistically and characteristically better at the game, um, there's a bigger base in NA. Yeah. And they've had the TV competitions. What was it, NBC that run? Uh, s- yeah, and NBC, I believe. They had the 2v2 yeah. with Yeah, and I think that was run by EU as well. <laughs> so they invited very few EU teams through qualifiers, and they actually won it as well. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is rich. But Ferg, you've been around CS forever, mm-hmm. and talking about viewership across esports titles it's standard for us not to really worry about our region if we're dedicated we wake up at four in the morning to watch it that's exactly right um but i suppose it's it's been a sort of second nature for us to to assume that we have to be at oddly hours to be able to watch these games obviously we throw our uh, you know we're, we're super excited whenever we get something over on the west coast in na because it works perfectly for us in the morning you can wake up wake up to some good cs yep uh, as for Europe, it's it's really tricky. I mean, you you could be up until 5 a.m. just to watch the last match of you know whatever major or major you know offline land that you're watching is, and it and it's just not appealing, I suppose. It's, yeah. You might watch it one night out of the five days that they're running the comp, and you surrender for the rest. So it's it's a really tricky situation for us in Oz, but. Uh, there's there's the people out there that commit hard and and I mean fortunately for, for for myself in my position you know I've got vods that I can just watch instead yeah uh, I miss out on the live you know atmosphere and and whatnot and the, the the fact that it is live is obviously a lot better than watching rewatching replays but um, you know there are the dedicated ones out there who who stick it through the whole event and watch till five a.m. and don't hear one complaint from them I mean it's it's just the way it is, I suppose. But and I think diehard fans, no matter what, in terms of live presence, are going to be there. Of course, for this, because you look at IEM Sydney, we had people flying from Denmark to come mm. watch. Like, you know, if they're dedicated and they want to be there, they'll be there. It is unfortunate that they can't just quickly dash over countries in Europe, and you know, it's it's quite easy to do that. But unfortunately, they can't. And that's the reality of it. And RLCS needs to watch out for their marketability mm. because they Definitely. want to grow this. The only way you grow it's with numbers. Definitely. And LeafX casting. And LeafX casting. And free God leaf damn it. <laughs> hashtag free LeafX. Hashtag Trump, please settle down and let Canadians into your country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's that simple, right? It's that simple. <laughs> this, uh, we'll move on. So R- RLCS is going to keep happening um, and we'll be covering as much of that as we can, yeah. of course. Oh, the just, I'll just touch what, yeah, one thing. The throwdown. I think you'll just lead into that. Yes. Throwdown. The teams qualified uh, for the packs. We had Jam, Chiefs, Pale Horse, and Silo. Now, this yeah. is the first time I've ever seen this all qualified with a record of five and two. Top four. Five Top and two. Four, going to land. Exact same record. Yeah. So that is going to be one of the closest series you'll find, or mm. finals, I think. Um, although Chiefs are a different team on land, so they'll Absolutely. go through. Uh, so there's a, there's a three-way fight for second place. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Throwdown will be heading those finals at PAX. So if you're heading to PAX, make sure you go to the eSports Arena and have a watch of those. If not, watch it online and support our Aussie boys and a couple of Kiwis who will be looking to head over to RLCS in yeah. Washington. Well, uh, Adzi's in Silla now and he's, he, is. he made it. Well, who? Go Adzi. Yeah, that's it. Express, local boy for Jam Gaming here in Adelaide. He'll be heading over. Yeah. Maybe we could get a grudge match between the two. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> Uh, Ferg, one of the topics, and there's a couple of them that I really want your insight and advice on tonight, and this is one of them. Lucky Seven, as some people may have seen on Twitter, uh, they're traditionally a trick-shotting org, and they've picked up a CSGO roster. Now, 
there's been some criticism, backdoor criticism as well as vocal on Twitter online. Why the hell is a trickshotting org picking up a CS roster, uh, an international trickshotting org picking up an OCE CS roster? But I disagree with this. I, I, like, it, well, I disagree with their criticisms because a lot of people forget that teams like Optic were in the same boat. Exactly. Um, look, I mean, to be blunt and also excuse my ignorance, um, I have no idea what trickshotting is. I went and looked, <laughs> I went and looked yep. at Lucky7 when they picked up the squad, um, which they now have um, for CSGO. And I just saw all this trickshotting stuff and it still didn't make any sense to me. So, I mean, enlighten me, please. Trickshotting is a thing that's happened way back since. Mainly COD is really where it originated, mm -hmm. uh, especially in your COD 4, your Modern Warfare, and even into Black Ops. Um, a lot of it was scoping with using okay. bolt action rifles was the best meta way to play um, in scrims you had like different uh, roles similar in cs very different in terms of gameplay but <laughs> similar and you'd have your scope but the scope wasn't hard angle holding or anything like that it was it's very much bang quick shotting yeah, yeah. um quick shotting involved in a trick shotting where people are jumping off of maps for the last kill in a, in a round to hit this long range shot as they're weapon changing and 360 and then bang hit their so shot the mlg game is mlg basically. game is okay. basically okay. that's okay. a trick no, that's shot that's easy to, to yeah. associate with <laughs> and so it's it's <laughs> massive like i mean phase were a big thing in trick shotting yeah, like right. phase were the name for it they had montages like these montages are like feature film worthy in terms of their editing and this like the the cgi stuff as well yeah um and that's how they made massive branding names for Excellent. themselves and then pick yeah. up esports teams seeing something similar here but okay. just a bit later on in the, yeah, in the schedule. So, um, well, now knowing that, I yep. suppose um, it's great that they're investing themselves into a, you know, oceanic team. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there should be any sort of disparity of, you know, an international organisation or international, you know, there might be European, there might be NA based or whatever it might be. I don't think there should be any sort of um, over overshadowing of, of an org doing, doing exactly that and investing into this scene. I think it's a great opportunity for a lot of these overseas teams to acquire very talented players and and talented teams that are that are waiting for the right opportunity and and i think we're really on the cusp of of seeing that change over at the moment where you know lots of things will be happening salaried players uh you know more trips overseas or more teams from overseas coming to us mm. um so there's definitely a, a movement happening and some people sort of don't really know it's happening or can't see it happening um, but I think this is probably one of the first instances where you see it becoming an adoption, I suppose. Um, as for the org itself, I don't really know too much about Lucky7. Uh, I've seen some mixed responses on Twitter about who they are and the fact that they might have been gone for a while. Um, and now they've re-emerged, which uh, I, don't, I don't see a problem there as long as the founders are the people that actually say who they were. Um, yep. And, and are backing the, 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 the org again. Um, I also know uh, personally one of the guys who, um, I think he signed up as a, a sales position in Lucky7, mm. um, who's called CBZ or Cavs Rifle. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah, he's a French bloke. Um, I've known him since 2004 or something, back in France, um, where I first met him. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's leading the charge in terms of you know some of their marketing stuff. and. I think he, he wouldn't really take on the job that's, you know, a Mickey Mouse um, sort yeah. of role. I think he's obviously been talking with some people that are pretty serious about what they want to do and have their goals and objectives. So, yeah, no doubt about it. I think they're going full steam ahead and, and you know, props to these, the, the new roster that they've acquired because I think they've got a, gr a great opportunity under their belt. Absolutely. Lewis, in terms of the marketing thing on this, because that's where I'm looking at it from a business perspective in creating content. It's something we talk about all the time in that organisations need to be better at the content they create because performance isn't everything. There needs to be something off the map. What's okay, your thoughts Marge on this? Okay, Marge <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's your thoughts um, on this? <laughs> Trickshotting Org picks up a roster. May as well. <laughs> no, I mean, like you've got, like with FaZe, like their social media is, like following is huge. And Absolutely. then they've got money off it to buy players. I mean, they bought Nico for a pretty penny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the end, why not? Um, and they've got, I mean, well, Ferg's going to be the best on. Like, if you want to have another look at the roster, like what, yep. ha what how do you think they'll compare? Uh, look, I mean, they're, they're going to have to start from scratch essentially it's, mm -hmm. it's a brand new lineup um i know that there's three of the guys inside this lineup that have been sort of playing together for the last six to 12 months so 
Uh, those people in particular are Eno, Ren, and Chris O'Wow. Mm -hmm. yep. um, Chris O'Wow is probably the latest inclusion of those three, um, but Eno and Ren have been sort of buddies, or, you know, teammates in game um, for, for a lengthy amount of time now. And I think that when you've got that, that basis of a core that's spent enough time together, you, can, you feel that you can speak together about certain things, your problems, your issues in game, how you can improve them. And all of a sudden, you know, the pieces that you need to add in, in on top of that uh, become more of like finding the, pe the perfect player for that role. Um, and it makes things 10 times easier. So uh, Animus, I think is, you know, he's a, he's a well-rounded player. He's been around the scene for a long time. Um, much like Chris O'Wall, I suppose, you know, he's got a lot of experience. He's played in a, a lot of Div 1, Div 1 teams and competitively in Div 1. Um, so I think he naturally brings a good, good amount of experience and, and can fill most roles as a rifler. Um, I think I've seen him warp a few times, but I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure who's going to be warping in this team. It could be Chris O, it could be Ren, I've seen warp as well, it could be Animus. So we'll, we'll see how that unfolds. But uh, the last inclusion, which is Zeph, um, I think that's a great pickup. I saw Zeph um, playing a lot of rank S before he had actually made it to his first lane, which was AEM the first season. Yeah. Um, and he was incredibly sharp. And he was a young guy, you know, I think he's 15, maybe 16 now. Um, but you could tell that he had the drive and the mentality of, uh, you know, someone that a lot of us pro players reflect upon ourselves. When we were young, we, we all had that drive at one point that got us to where we are now and I think that's definitely what he shows and um, I'm glad that he's sort of landed in a team like this. I was, you know, I was hoping that other teams might sort of give him a chance and there was a few opportunities over this sort of changeover period where people have been changing players in and out. But I mean, there's also the sanction that he hasn't got that much experience. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, taking those sorts of punts when the competition is so close at the top four is, is obviously very risky. Um, so I can understand why teams didn't want to take that type of risk. Uh, but I think he's a very sort of low potential risk, like in the sense that he probably will outshine the thoughts of someone that doesn't have any experience. You've got to remember a lot of people can come into like, you know, come into lands unexperienced and just destroy everyone. Um, it's just a matter of confidence. So there's always a black horse somewhere. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you look at Texter, Great example of a player that didn't have any lane experience until Zen League qualifier for season one, mm. and he just went nuts. Um, and now you look at Texter every game. Yeah, and, and, you and watch every time Texter. he rocks up at land, he'll he'll drop thirties and do his part, and you know, and he knows his role, which is to destroy everyone. And, <laughs> yeah. um, and it's good, and that's the sort of confidence you need in, like you know, your, your key players, your role players, and I think that's exactly what Zef can sort of become in this roster. Um, and I think they've got a real, really well-rounded team. I know um, I've, I've played with Eno at the last uh, you know, nationals that I attended, mm -hmm. um, which was for the AEL finals. And he's a very vocal player. He's great with comms. He's very sharp. You know, he's, he's very well-rounded. He's obviously got a lot of experience as well. So, And then Ren, I, um, I had a bit of a dabble before I quit my playing uh, season um, or my playing career. Um, and he was also great. Uh, you know, he was, once again, another player that just focuses 100% on CS. Hasn't been too much in terms of Div 1 teams, haven't seen him too much in the Div 1 scene, but uh, when I was playing a couple of scrims with him, he was outstanding. Um, very mechanically gifted, extremely sharp, a little bit quiet, but, you know, there's comms, I think, are some things you know, a lot of people can improve on on an individual basis. It's not something that, it's not like raw aim where you, you know, you either have it or you don't. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, look, I mean, very well-rounded team. I think they've got a great opportunity, you know, to, to do some damage and hopefully we'll, we'll catch them, uh, you know, at the upcoming lands. I think we awesome. will. So congratulations, Lucky7. Congratulations to that roster. Uh, we expect big things and we'll be looking out for you guys. If you want to weigh in on the discussion, jump on Twitter. Let us know what you think at the eSports show uh, and get involved. We don't have live tweets tonight, unfortunately. We're, we're not getting into them while we're on no. the show, but we'll, we'll have a discussion later on tonight. We don't have the Badger, Badger PC. We the, don't have Badger the, on his Twitter prowess tonight, <laughs> but we do have Ferg, so good trade. <laughs> um, this, this is one for a bit of a laugh, but there is some serious discussion around this. Gemba Group uh, have released a study on esports and exercise. We've actually got a graphic we'll, we'll pull up to show you guys regarding this. Uh, it was a study for 16 to 29 year old esport fanatics uh, and says that they are more likely to participate in sport, particularly team sports. 
This one was really interesting, and, and I want to preface this discussion by saying causation and correlation are two very different things in these kinds of studies. Uh, looking at this graph as well to kind of break down what's going on here. On the graph on the left, you've got people who have participated in sports in the last 12 months. On the right, you've got a bar graph displaying what percentage of, of the studied population participate in team sports. Uh, to break it down, yellow is men 16 to 29, the green is women uh, 16 to 29, and then the blue and pink is men and women respectively, who are esports fans. This isn't targeting esports players directly, but fans. And the stats are interesting. For just men, 16 to 29 years old, 86% of them participated in sports in the last year with 54% of them playing a team sport. For women, it was 83% participating and 27% playing team sports. It gets interesting when we get into esports uh, followers. So esports men, 92% participated in sports within the last year, 71% of them playing in a team sport. And esports women, 91% participated in the last year with 59% of them in a team sport. Look, studies like this, uh, they can go anywhere. And you can draw as much or as little inference out of them as you want. But maybe it's time we have actual discussion about the fact that esports isn't fat dudes with neck beards sitting in mum's basement. Except for me, but... <laughs> <laughs> Minus the basement part. But, um... Sitting upstairs in a, in a, in a gamer's lounge. <laughs> That's right. No different. But, um, I, I mean, I can relate to that topic. I, I've been playing team sports for you know, since the beginning of my potential ability to be able to play sports, so, you know, since a young and, and I still play team sports to this day casually with, you know, social clubs and things like that, so I, I believe it's definitely there, those, those stats and those figures are, are definitely true. Um, I think people neglect that, that vision of fat, sweaty nerds sort of sitting in basements all day and dwelling, but... World of Warcraft guy. Yeah, yeah I think South it. Park helped a lot yeah. with that one, um, <laughs> despite the great comedy that was derived from it but um yeah i think it's it's definitely something that uh the stats need to sort of be, be need to be reminded to people in the general public because um yeah it's, it's definitely this uh this overshadowing cast of doubt that people have in not just general public have in uh, in players or people that play computer games and i mean i've copped this so much flack as well from just uneducated people in my family that, you know, like in-laws and stuff like that. My, well, not my direct in-laws, they're very supportive. I'll, I'll say that before my wife hits me uh, later on. But even family members of mine that look at what I'm doing in esports and go, oh, gaming, cool. Like, how's your Crash Bandicoot commentary, you douche? <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah, cool. Like, he spins those boxes really freaking well. <laughs> but, like, they don't understand it. They think I'm an idiot. They think I'm wasting my time. Yeah, I'm wasting a law idiot. degree. <laughs> I am an idiot. Like, we don't dispute these facts. But when you bundle them together, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's the standard layperson thought about it. Yeah, but I mean, when you get you go to sport, it's just standard sports idiot thug. Like, <laughs> so you get it both ways, but in different in different ways. That's mm. right. Same, same, but different. And, and for, for footage as well, um, this is we, we actually have a, a wonderful image depicting what most people think that esports is. Uh, if we can if we can bring that up, uh, here's esports for you, duct taped to the ceiling. Uh, in Mum's basement, <laughs> and um, we also have an exclusive picture of performance enhancing. Uh, meals being eaten uh, as well by these e-gaming athletes. <laughs> so, look, perceptions might eventually change, but uh, and that one's that one's a classic uh, of an old school land party. But at the end of the day, it, it'll it'll change over time. And as much as we want to talk about, I want to talk about educating people and saying like, you know, esports is a thing. At the same time, I follow suit with a lot of other people, and I've had my thinking change that we need to stop saying esports is a thing because. Uh, there was a couple of articles I read earlier in the week that said if we stop trying to quantify it and justify it, it will be a thing. If we stop trying to say, no, mm. it's mainstream, guys, look at it. Uh, we exist and this is, it, this is really cool. Pay attention to us. <laughs> yeah, you know, stop trying to draw everyone in because everybody that enjoys esports is here right now. And everyone who doesn't understand it isn't there, which is, uh, we'll bring that up in coming weeks when I can correlate a lot of data together. Oh, okay. Are you going to have your own bar graphs? I, I, might, I might actually. Can we have a pie I graph of your favourite bars and a bar graph of your favourite pies? You certainly can and I'll put it on a chart. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Lewis. But yeah, it'll change with time. It will and that's, that's, what, we, that's what it needs. Time, time and awareness. Mm -hmm. Now, 
this one, Lewis, is a topic that you wanted to bring up. Mm. And I want to encourage viewers, whether this is live right now, whether it's people on the VOD or on the podcast version on SoundCloud later, just enter this whole conversation with an open mind. Because as soon as you open your mouth in the next 30 seconds to yeah. state your point, a lot of people are going to want to flame oh, that'll you. That'll be in a couple minutes. Yeah. <laughs> that'll be in so a couple minutes. To, I don't want people to, to jump down your fact. throat because no. you're playing the devil's advocate on this and it's a discussion that I think is healthy that we need to, to bring out. Yeah, certainly Take right. us away, my friend. Um, well, so this isn't a controversial bit just yet. No. If, if it, even if it is controversial, but it will, it will generate discussion. Um, there's a new company coming out called Esports Gold, looking mm -hmm. for four, uh, 5.4 million US dollars. Um, although it is on a cryptocurrency, which I'm not a fan In of. In Ether tokens? Yeah, for Ethereum. I'm personally not a fan of that, mm -hmm. but we'll move that aside. We'll assume you can use real money. Yep even though it's real money, just don't go there. <laughs> um, to create a new esports betting platform. Yes, and uh, quoted to be an all-encompassing esports entertainment hub. Yeah, so what that means, that what that sounds like to me, is that they're going to look at either streaming, like such as either being a new Twitch or being like a HLTV. Okay, all right, following through. So I, I had a look at this as well. Um, and to quote some stats from Esports Insider, because they actually spoke to Esports Gold about their intentions. Um, and Esports Gold has released a white paper document. It's like 26 pages long of their intentions, how it's going to work and stuff like that. Uh, it, it takes a little bit to digest, so I'm not going to go through that now, but we'll probably link something in the YouTube VOD uh, later so people can yeah. access that. Um, but Esports Gold also states that it aims to provide the community with an ethical sports betting platform and content aggregator, including streaming, reviews and data provision. So, I mean, that touches on what you're looking at. Uh, I think it's not only they're looking to be either Twitch or a new version of Twitch or be a new HLTV, looking at both. Both. And uh, they're also looking at running tournaments as well. So, like, kind of like a unicorn, but, like, doing it at the level that you'd want. Because, mm. I mean, unicorn's nice and all, but, well, their graphical user interface is horrible. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not a fan of that, personally. No. Personally, some people might enjoy it and they know their way around it. Yeah. But... Um, I'm not a huge fan of it, but if they can group sort of esports together and create an easier viewing platform, that for me is a good thing. Now, this is where I sort of go into the, the question, mm. is Twitch and YouTube doing enough for esports? Okay. Ferg, I'm going to let you start this one. you have an opinion on this one? Yeah, Do, look, does Twitch support esports enough? I, I think Twitch definitely supports supports esports enough, if not too much. Um, not in a negative manner, as despite me sort of pro producing it in that manner. Yeah. Um, but look, they, they, they're definitely overhauling the scene in terms of um, covering everything mm -hmm. and anything. Um, and I think that's pretty much their goal. And... You know, I mean, they've got IRL streams now as well. And that's, I think it's a huge market. Um, it's grass viewers from God knows where and mm. also streamers from God knows where um, to report their daily lives. <laughs> and it's uh, quite an interesting uh, facet. But um, in terms of someone trying to take over that, that market or I think that's essentially what YouTube is trying to do at the moment is they're trying to compete in that industry. Um, they're failing very hard yeah. And, yeah. and they've come in with money. So they're not only just saying, well, we'll just create a platform for people to come and stream on. Similar to what Twitch did to start with. That's basically what Twitch was. It was Justin TV. Just come on and stream if you yeah. want, you know, and if someone wants to watch you, so be it. Um, whereas now it's, you know, it's a massive corporate company and then, you know, they, they pretty much have to, you have to pay them to stream rather than, you know, the opposite. So. YouTube's come in, they've got a huge bundle of money, billions of dollars, and they've gone to the biggest organisers of competitions and said, here's paycheck and time to stream on our platform. So they're trying to undercut, well, not undercut, but, you know, buy out Twitch's customers, mm. even though Twitch has no sort of tie to those customers. Yeah. But um, converting them to their platform, and the results have been horrendous. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's really a brand... Um, what is, what's the word? A brand sort of uh, association, but not only association, it's like the um, attachment mm. to the brand. It's like when you pick your favourite beer, like you have that attachment. It doesn't matter if the other beer next to it tastes better, 
you pick your beer because you're attached to that beer. That's that's why you, you drink it. It's your yeah. beer. Um, it's similar to Twitch platformers. People want to watch everything on Twitch. They prefer Twitch. They like their remotes. They like, you know, all the things that come with Twitch that, that makes it Twitch. Um, so converting to YouTube has like been a disaster, in my opinion. So for this new guys to try and say that they're going to be better than Twitch in every respect and HLTV, and they're just going to bring everyone everything under one roof, I think it's, um, it's a wild dream. Um, and I think it's very unrealistic. And despite them having a massive business plan that could blow away investors and seem so appealing, um, I think the reality, if you do your due diligence, is it's just not a possibility. No, and it's something that you and I have spoken about previously uh, behind closed doors, Lewis, in that for esports to be all encompassing like this on a platform, that just doesn't work. Um, Okay, cool. We'll get to that bit. We've got some breaking news for a little bit later, but um, it, it won't work because it's so huge. Like, yeah, basically what we're talking about is not only the ESPN of eSports, mm. and, and that in and, in and of itself is a massive thing, but then to have accurate markets on those eSports to offer this betting site and this functionality, not only that, but do all of the data collection that rivals HLTV across eSports I don't think that's possible. We looked at doing that for stuff like Rocket League and the sheer manpower you need because they don't have a developed API to do this very well is ridiculous. Mm. I think $5.4 million would have helped though. Would help. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> it's they can get near it, enough. I think it's, no, it's not, not near enough. Near enough. But what, yeah. Yeah, what I want to sort of get into about um, if sort of Twitch in particular, because I mean mm -hmm. YouTube, um, YouTube, although like, I think it's a smoother streaming service than Twitch uh, yeah. overall. Um, and it's, I like the function that you can go back in time a lot easier uh, while live. Um, Twitch is a fantastic platform. It is. Right? However, for me, it can be too difficult to find esports and in particular grassroots or lower than the first tier esports. And we're not talking about like your community tournaments here. We're not talking about just a Sunday comp for a couple of hundred bucks. Like grassroots like CGPO, it's the best in our region. It's not ESL1, it's not IEM. It's grassroots because it's local. That stuff is hard to find unless you know where it is because mm -hmm. uh, like, you, yeah. like we've talked about, it, it might not actually be the top thing on CSGO, for example, if you go to CSGO or twitch.tv. No, well, that slash still CSGO. probably isn't. I mean, yeah. that's incredibly good competitive play and you'll still have streamers above that. So w what I see Twitch as is a, a platform for streamers, the people who want to stream themselves, playing games, IRL, whatever, right? And then esports has been thrown in there. So what, like personally, which I'd I mean, like that see. kind of speaks yeah. to its origins mm -hmm. on just as Justin TV as yeah, well. Exactly. Yeah. And like for like people like yourself, I'm not too sure about you, folk, but. Like you guys, do you watch streamers or? I, I look, I'm not a avid fan of watching personal streams. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, Dr. Disrespect, I've watched his highlights and stuff, but I'm not there every time he goes live. So yeah. I'd have to say no, like I'm not a, yeah. a, a follower of personal streams. Yeah. And so like, Matt, you watch, you watch lots of streams. I do. You, I you do. get into it, you stream yourself. I'm picky with who I watch. Yeah. Um, well, you've got to be, there's that mm, many. That's <laughs> right. And, and I have set criteria, like m most viewers, is that I'm not just watching a stream because, hey, there's a stream of X game. I'm watching it because I, I, I want to get something out of it. Whether that's, yeah. it's a new ga release game and I want to see actual gameplay footage. For the most part, for me, because new release games, I don't want to see gameplay footage of them if I'm actually looking to buy it. Yep. Because I've done my Spoiling. look into it. Spoilers, that's right. But for me, it's all about entertainment fact value. Yeah, exactly. Um, Dr. Disrespect, I watch him because he's an entertainer, mm. not because he's playing video games. Yeah. So I watch, like, I, I think there's only ever, like, one streamer that I've actually ever sort of really watched for the entertainment factor. Yeah. I, on a whole, don't watch streamers and yep. struggle to watch streamers. Um, I just want eSports. Like I want competitions up the wazoo. Like I get home from work, I just want to throw an eSports competition on. I don't care what it is, mm. but I don't want to have to trawl through 300 streamers to before, find your eSports before stream. I find one. And then mm. it might be a horrible one in like Russian or something that I don't understand. <laughs> and then I've got to go looking again and I've got to go through all the eSports. I'd just like to see either like a, like say, a, uh, Twitch.esports or something that was just like, here you go, stream it to here, here's where your esports go. Same same service, yeah. same mm. kind of thing. Link in your followers, link the sites. 
but just make it so I can I can find yeah, these esports. Yeah. For for me, uh, and I sit on the other side of this a little bit and say that I don't think there's a lot more that Twitch can do as a platform as a tool. Oh, their platform's see, perfect. I already. see Twitch as a yeah. tool yeah. in that it is a streaming tool used by broadcasting groups by events to have an online presence. Hmm. And keeping that in mind, I agree with you on, okay, yes, some functionality of this tool could be added to say, here's your streamers, here's eSports over here. And we can have them. If you want to look at CSGO and what CSGO streams are live, yeah, it's the exact same feed we've got now. But if you're looking for eSports, some functionality to say, here, eSports streams that are verified or anything like that, so we can actually find, hey, this is an official, go watch it in this section. I can, I can, I can understand yeah. that. But for me, I feel that and this is a conversation that happens all the time on Twitter as well, in Reddit, everywhere, is where do you draw the line? Because you get people coming out here, and, and from my point of view, is it should be on the organiser. If you, as a major event, can't get your marketing done properly, can't actually get it spread out and let the people who are interested in your event know where it's found, that's on you, and that's yeah. your failure. Especially when you've got major events put on by massive companies that have a marketing department. Yeah. If your team can't do their job, that they're paid a salary to do, that's your problem, not Twitch as a tool. And, and then it goes yeah. further. I mean, it, it developers does. as and well. I, mm. And I definitely don't disregard that developers should be in there uh, promoting their appropriately and mm. then promoting grassroots appropriately as, appropriate, uh, appropriately yeah. <laughs> as well. <laughs> but like sometimes like I just want to like, and of course drawing the line's difficult. Yeah. And it like, I just want to see, like, even if it's just like an RLO Sunday stream, like, I'd just like that to be sort of separated because, I mean, you've got Rocket League. I don't want to have to go down 25 people to then go, and there's Rocket League because they're on different channels now as well. You've got to find all the channels. I mean, once you've got them all favorited, happy days. You get the notification, it's all good. But finding those notifications, there's still a lot of channels I go, wow, this exists? Yeah. <laughs> And I just like a little bit better. I mean, that's where I think if this esports gold can come in and just go, look, here's all the esports. Like, even if I'm not, even if I don't want to bet on the games, if they can just, go, it's like, look, here's like all you, because they wanted to do it on uh, tournaments, only $10,000 price pool or more. Mm -hmm. If they just went, here's the list of the streams, I would be watching it through their site. Yeah. Because, and I would go straight there just because it's listed, it's nice. It's and got it's, a, it's got a niche that it could fill. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's essentially like HLTV in, in, exactly. in a very exactly. bigger scale. Yeah. But yeah, you know, HLTV really does cover pretty much everything these guys want to do, but just for CS. Yeah. But HLTV really does a good job for mm. CS:GO. Of course. Yeah. Huge. Because Huge. I mean, um, what the last CGP game uh, that we didn't cover here, uh, Nutter's covered. Yeah. Right. He's not going to get over three thousand views if it's not on HLTV. Mm. Yeah. If it's just left to be on Twitch, he's going to be sitting down there with 100 viewers or something. That's right. Completely obscure over the across the, the CSGO. There's people that want to watch that, and they found that through another website. Through a third so party, I, HLTV. Yeah, I think Twitch could help in that respect. Okay. It's not all on Twitch. No. But I think they can help. And there's always improvements to be made. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I can agree with that. I, I think that... It, we need to be careful in any of these discussions, and that's why I had my little preface before mm. we opened this up, because, I mean, I, I made comment about it, didn't really get into an argument on Twitter like I might have liked, but I made a comment about Rocket League. There was a high-profile Rocket League caster for RLCS who was saying, I don't really like watching Twitch streams. Psyonix needs to make a more interesting, entertaining game mode for Rocket League people to stream. And that t irks me to no end, because how in the hell yeah. is it the developer's responsibility to make a stream entertaining? And I mean, mm. like you got Cronovi, he was beating RLCS numbers when RLCS started. Yeah. Just through his name and people found him entertaining. That's right. That, it was absolutely huge. And uh, yeah, that probably isn't up to the developer. No. Um, but also the, there was something said about um, people only want to watch the top tier. It's like, throw out every other league, <laughs> yeah. throw out CGI, throw out... Um, yeah, well that's, that's 
that immediately becomes debunked as soon as you put bloody gambling on these games and then uh -huh. all of a sudden everyone floods in. You know, it's, it's, it's such yeah. a big attachment being it, having five or a hundred dollars yeah. attached to the game. And that does help the, if they can do it all encompassing. Mm. Um, like gambling is a dark side of sort of the sports and esports world. it's a world. reality, yeah. And it happens. Most people have a bet on a game. I have a bet on games every now and then, mostly sports because like, who would bet on OCEC, yes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, mistakes were made, yeah. Lots yep. of people made that one. <laughs> Who but, was uh, one? Frank had to block someone from the Chiefs account. Not only that, but the person Frank yeah. blocked then went and turned to emailing Chiefs <laughs> to hang shit on them for not performing well when he bet on them. Uh, I think Tanner Mines have experienced those ones Plenty. a few times as well. And it's, I mean, look, it's the nature of it, I'm sure. AFL teams get hate mail every time they lose a t they lose a game from you know the odd uh, the odd punter yep but um, who lost his life savings yeah. you know, <laughs> that seventeen year old basement dweller that has his parents' house and stuff still but hopefully he never acquires a house of his own um, <laughs> because he'd bet it on the yeah, Crows exactly, winning the premiership yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so so silly but um, yeah. yeah look I mean I, I think it is definitely a dark side but it's it's what the investors want is they want to know that there is a gambling side available in the industry um, yeah. and you know I think that's that's where it all lies and it's the same with traditional sports is they only get so big because of the gambling side of it and, and the fact that it draws so many people to the game and it doesn't matter if they've never played or watched the game before if they've got money on it they are completely 100% engaged well that that um, like I said, this, that's actually what got me into baseball in the first place. Yeah. Like, St. Louis made the World Series, and I was like, yeah, that's a team <laughs> I can <could> bet on. <laughs> so, so I put on them, and they won it in the most crazy fashion, and then I was just hooked to baseball. Like, it actually got me into the game. And then, mm. I, then I didn't have to bet on baseball to watch it. I could just watch it. Yeah. And, I mean, I mean relating that to esports, remember watching... East, uh, League of Legends at my place on my TV. Oh, don't bring that. <laughs> there was one time Lewis came over. We had a yeah. few of my mates over at our house and we put, I think it was NALCS on, no, on the it TV. Was, it was, was, it World even, Champs, was it Worlds? It was Worlds or like I, an MSI thing or I don't, think it was, I don't think it was specifically Worlds, but it was like a, a world competition. Yeah, it, it was a global event for yeah. League. Anyway, we, I said to Lewis, come over, we'll have some drinks, we'll hang out, come watch some League of Legends. I've got no idea about League of Legends at this stage in my life. Before like, we zero. touched esports together. Yeah. We were just... I don't know what a MOBA is at this stage. Yeah, this <laughs> yep. is before he's even said, come, come to AGTV. This is, well, this is <laughs> this going is, back. Yeah. And we're sitting there watching it. And Lewis is like, oh, so what's going on here? What's this? And then as soon as he put just a $20 bet, sports, because he I think found I put like sports... Five, I think I put five or ten on Yeah, because sports, sports bet had a market. Yeah. <laughs> And all of a sudden, he's like hands on knees watching this, like, yeah, I'm yelling like this louder is... than them. <laughs> and we're the ones that know what's going on. Someone gets a tower and he screams, and we're just like, cool, dude, that doesn't matter. But it was engagement, <laughs> exactly. you know? Exactly. Um, at the end of the day, whether you like the ethics of gambling or you don't like gambling, regardless, it's here. Mm. Uh, and you can debate that as much as you like. But if companies are looking to leverage it, in a responsible way, I, can, I should say. Yeah. Putting it out there saying, look, if you're gonna do it, do it here, because we manage this well, and we've got the viewership here for you, it's convenient, it's a tool that people can now use, like Esports Gold's providing, then why not? Yeah, exactly right. And because you do have, like, I personally prefer, like, say, Bet365 over Sportsbet, because I don't agree with some of Sportsbet's policies. Mm. So, like, I'll gravitate towards that. So if they can do, like, something, like, less gimmicky, just straight up and down, nice like that's gonna that's gonna blow up i think so as well let us know what you think uh online as well get onto us at the esports show on twitter or, or or grab any of us personally at judge brand at tibor time uh at ferg underscore csgo that's one yes got it um and let us know what you think about about gambling about esports gold uh, and about whether twitch or youtube or any other platforms do enough for esports and it's broadcasting globally. And what they could do to change it up. What, would you, what features would you like to see? Um, now, I'm going to interject with some breaking news that's just come through. Uh, we've been having a look and covering uh, and reading about what's going on with League of Legends locally in terms of teams and re-signings, particularly Direwolves. They're going through a re-signing period with their players. Yeah. One of them's now retired. So Fantix has just announced his retirement from Direwolves and it says, uh, his statement, my decision to step away from professional play didn't come easy, but I felt as though I was ready to move on to the next stage of my life. 
In saying this, I'm still deeply passionate about League of Legends and believe I can use my skills and knowledge to raise the standard of players in the OCE region. I'm excited to be staying on board with Direwolves and look forward to working with my replacement from Richard Fantix Sue. So he's retired from play, but still Direwolves looking to work with his replacement, I imagine in a, in a coaching capacity. Yep. Reminds me of someone else we know. Yeah. Who's no longer playing in his well, coaching. Well, hopefully not in the coaching capacity, because that's Chuch's brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that is currently coaching the team, and I yep. believe he is phenomenal. Um, you know, I take notes from, from Chuch and his recommendations on how to approach coaching. So, mm. you know, hopefully it's not for his position, but, you know, maybe an anal analytics position or, you know, I'm sure assistant coaches are, are needed these days with the way that the games are expanded. I mean... I'd love an assistant coach with given how much I have to do. Mm -hmm. um, mm. It would be brilliant in terms of being able to share the workload. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, it's, um, it's definitely a good transition for anyone that's been at a very high tier level to be, and when I say high tier level, I mean like competing overseas, getting the experience and the feeling, knowing the pressure, all these things that you would not know until you've actually done it yourself. Yeah. And you couldn't teach someone how to handle it until you've experienced it yourself. Obviously, you can use general like guidance, like theses and you know theories of how people anticipate pressure and how they deal with it. But when it comes to gaming, it's completely different. I've played you know fairly high tier sports like tennis and um, rugby when mm -hmm. I was younger, um, and I can tell you right now that the pressures I had in very high pressure matches and actual sports had no way of any relevance to the same sort of pressures you get when you're on a big stage, crowds cheering you know, playing some of the best teams in the world. Um, yeah. th there is no comparison. The pressure is huge in that sort of an environment. Um, you know, you're also dependent on your, your mental game in CS and any other computer game, really, realistically speaking. And um, that really impedes the most when you're on these big stages and, and put into these high pressure situations. And if you can't control yourself mentally, you can kiss your you know, your whole game plan individually, goodbye. You, you just won't be able to handle it and your, your performance will just drop off instantly. Yeah. So um, for someone to be able to go into that position or into, you know, similar to me, into to a position of coaching where you've, you've done the rounds, um, it's, it's great value. Um, and I'm not saying that people without that experience are useless because that's ignorant and, and not correct. But I think it's just a very big um, advantage that uh, an ex-player having competed at overseas can, can bring to the table. Absolutely, it's those insights that yep. are important because playing and coaching are two very different things. Uh, and being able to convey the points, you might know the game in your head as a player, as an ex-player, as a pro, but conveying that to a team of people that depend on you to organise a game, to structure strategy, to help them with their, their mentality and their mind space, two very, very different things. Yeah, well, mm. my main point on that is um, you don't see many NFL coaches playing in the NFL. No. They're not normally ex-NFL players. Mm. They don't have to play the game to know what they need to do. But the difference is they, for the most part, are ex-assistant coaches. And before that, well, of ex course, interns. Yeah, you're going they work their way up. They yeah. learned how to coach. And we don't have that sophistication yet in eSports. Yeah. It'll get there one day. I'd love to and get that, Ferg an assistant coach. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, just to interrupt, but I think also in, in that respect as well, is like similar to what I was saying before, in that in physical sports and things mm -hmm. like that, the pressures and mental game of these... I mean, let's not beat around the bush. NFL produces brain-dead people at the age of 50. Players, that is. You know, yeah, they, through concussions. Exactly, well, that's well, because right. it's, it's literally just heavy contact sport. Yep. Minute after minute. Um, they're probably not feeling any mental pressure. <laughs> 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 so, so to be able to coach them, you're really... <laughs> as a coach in the NFL, you're really looking at the strategic side of things and... I mean, you play enough Madden, you'll learn the strategy. Um, so, I mean, not, that was beautiful, Ferg. That was beautiful. Them, but look, it's, uh, I think it's, a, it's a, I, I, I sympathise for the, the analogy, but I think, yep. you know, you look at something maybe like AFL, you'll find a lot of the AFL coaches are players. Yeah. Um, or have played, or yep. done something. And the reason being is, like, that is a completely different game to NFL. Oh, yeah. Or, like, a lot of on-the-spot thinking, mm. which... So, like, a lot of it is just situational. Mm -hmm. um, and you've just got to be ready to react at the right time when it matters. You know, you're down by a goal, 50 seconds left. You've got to make the right decision. Similar to CS, you know, yep. bomb down, 30 seconds left in the round. It's 15-14. 
it's either taking it to OT or losing the game. Same sort of pressures, like same sort of situational uh, positioning. And I think that what the coaches in AFL can bring to their players is, you know, sympathising in that respect and saying, you know, I've been in that position. I can tell you how we can do it a lot better. Yeah. And also the other side of that as well is that when it comes from someone that has the experience, you get the respect of the players. Yep. So um, kind of like uh, Brent Riley going over and coaching legacy players in that kind of realm? Brent Riley. Um, so uh, Crow, yeah, Crow's uh, AFL footballer. Uh, star of the team. Yeah. Uh, they've gone over. Oh, of course. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Now, now coaching legacy, legacy uh, team members. But basically, the, the infrastructure that uh, Adelaide Football Club has behind them, mm -hmm. um, which is a great analogy talking about how AFL plays out as a sport, comparing it to CS. Mm. AFL club staff are now getting heavily involved in the esports side of things. Brent's going over there and coaching these players on mindset and mentality and, and how to play the game well, yeah. without actually talking about mechanics of the game. Of course, and I think that's, that's another like, exact analogy about situational thinking and how to deal with the pressures of the situations. Mm. And mm. I think that's, that's the rapport that he can probably bring in that respect. But obviously, like with coaches in CS, there's still going to be a vast difference between that and an AFL coach. Mm. Um, you know, like, I can obviously speak on and on about mental fitness and, and making sure you're prepared for the game mentally and how, how you're going to deal with the pressure and how to absorb it and then also just get rid of it. Um, but that really rests on the players on the day and, and how they can deal with it. And a lot of players that are at this level already have already got a good sort of grip on their, their mental emotions in game. Mm. Um, a lot of people are cold hearted, you know, we've got a few cold hearted killers in our team and it's great to have those sorts of players, you know, you can depend on them not to, to crack under pressure. So, but I think the second part really is the, 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 the feedback that you give to the players, it's, let's say they make a mistake in the game. If you're someone that's got absolutely no experience, there's always going to be a headbutt about how do you know better? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, obviously, like, in sports, you can watch a million matches and stuff like that, and you can learn a lot about the game without playing it. Um, but CS is a lot different. It is. Yeah. And Absolutely. I think a, a lot of computer games are, in that same respect, a lot different to, to sports. You could watch a million CS games. I know for a fact. I've spoken with, like, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to throw him under the bus, but Thorin used to do my head in because, like, in 1.6, he still had that same ego where he thought he knew everything, but I could see the words coming out of his mouth and they just, you could tell it's the guy that's watched, maybe played casually, but has, still has no idea what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if he went into a coaching role, people just would butt heads with him the whole time because they just wouldn't believe that he knows what he's talking about. Absolutely. Um, so I think that's, that's the little edge that I think a player or ex-player can bring as a coach. Um, and, and I think it's really just the, the general topic of having your players respect the coach. Yep. Well, now, yeah, so you've been in a lot of high-pressure situations. Uh, you've played on national television. Yes. Yep. So I want to I sort of, I've got a, a nice little clip here, and I sort of want to get your mentality uh, in, in uh, this scenario, uh, if, we can get, if we can get this clip up here. So I just want to kind of get your thoughts in this sort of stressful situation. <laughs> um, yeah, as you can see, we didn't, didn't even know which map it was. <laughs> That's going to be that one of the edited frame. ones, surely. <laughs> surely that was edited. That was edited. That was edited. <laughs> <laughs> I would not have put that one on. <laughs> that, was, too, yeah. that was, um, that's brilliant. Let's yeah. have a look again. Ready for Ferg's face? Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> right there. As I was gentlemen. mentioning to the guys before, is, um, you know, that was probably take 20 of uh, that map wheel. Um, <laughs> but yeah, look, I mean, the pressures of playing on national telly, to be honest, it was in a studio, um, beautiful studio. Uh, out in um, Sydney and um, look I mean I've always found like if there's no crowd then you don't have to worry uh, you just shouldn't feel it it's just same as at home on Twitch chat kind of thing yeah exactly I mean in 1.6 the previous version of Counter-Strike that I played competitively at a high level it was a bit different because you could be playing at home on an online match we didn't have the numbers of today but I mean you know let's say when we were at land finals and there wasn't a big crowd it was similar you know just in a back space where yep but you've got 10,000 people watching. If you press tab, you can see, you know, exactly how many people, it's the same as CSGO, but because of Twitch, the way it works, sometimes it doesn't show, it just shows three spectators and then yep. it could be 50,000 people. Oh, so Twitch. you would see in game. You would see in game how many yeah. people are watching. All of a sudden, like, you cave, like, it's like, oh, mm. Jesus, like, <laughs> everyone's watching me. 
Um, so it, it becomes a bit different, but because you know that one was pretty low key in a studio, you know, a couple of spectators because it was the the, the, the casters, um, there there wasn't too much pressure. Um, okay. But I mean, in respect to that, I don't think it, it would have mattered in the light of you know, ten thousand people in a stadium. I think it's one of those things that you adopt over time and you build. It's like building you know tough yeah. skin for it. Is you, you get used to it, but. I think for anyone that's only played studio games and then gets thrown into the crowd atmosphere, that's going to be a different story for them when it comes to that sort of stage. Um, yeah, that'll, that, that can that's when they'll start feeling it. Challenges, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let us know uh, what you think in terms of coaching. We wish Fantix all the best with whatever he decides to do moving forward with the Dire Wolves uh, and the League of Legends team as well. Uh, it, it's a massive conversation on coaching. It's something that there's no quick solution for either. Uh, it'll just be a development over time in esports when we get assistant coaches, analysts and stuff like that in. But I don't think it's a, a discussion we can dive into tonight. No, but especially in a young, like fairly young scene, uh, even just esports in general, fairly young. So you don't have as many like retired pros that have done it all. Mm. So you are, you've it's, got a, a it's the starting phase. Pool. So it's, yeah. and it's, It'll keep going as I suppose year by year yeah. happens. You know, one person's going to drop off after being competing in CS:GO professionally for five years. Yeah. Um, and it's you know it's just like our aging population dilemma. You know, it's eventually it's going to all keep coming around the wheel, and yeah. we'll have too many ex-players that want to be coaches. Yep. And then our silver and casters will be out the job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> talking about casters out of a job. Good segue, Lewis. Um, <laughs> This cast is definitely not out of a job, but considered pulling out. Sadikist had an Previously. interview. Previously, not anymore. Uh, but Sadikist had an interview with the Score Esports, and um, we're not going to play that now. It was lengthy. There's a lot of text to it as well. And this fly loves me. Um, <laughs> but it brings up a topic that I want to discuss, especially with someone that knows what it's like being in the heat of it, sitting with us with you, Ferg. Uh, and it's the reason why we have the title of the show this week being burned out. Because uh, Sadika's interview outlined that there was a period of time where he was burned out, where he's sitting in a hotel room going, I'm done. Mm -hmm. This is too much. I'm traveling. I'm working constantly. I'm exhausted. When's the off season? When does it stop? Um, he mentioned in the interview that he was considering taking six months off just to actually experience what life was like again. Yeah. So... I want to pivot this discussion because if you want to look at what Sadika said, go and have a look at that interview. Um, the score did an amazing job of it. But I want to pivot that discussion and have a chat with you, Ferg, about downtime for esports, uh, specifically CS being your esport of choice. I mean, we've discussed off cam how League of Legends has quite some downtime because you look at Worlds. Not every team's at Worlds. They get this period off. Mm -hmm. yep. Same with MSI, Rift Rivals. They have breaks. But for CS, you don't sleep. No. Um, look, I mean, obviously the beauty of League of Legends is that it's completely coordinated by the publisher. Um, I think once upon a time, like, don't quote me on this, but there were small-time TOs trying to run comps and become big dogs in, in that sort of manner. Yeah, well, I mean, Cyber Gaming used got, to run stuff for our region. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like, I'm not saying that you guys were trying to be the biggest or, you know, whatever, but it's just being a part of a big game. And that's what Cyber Game is notorious for is having tournaments placed for the big big titles out there. Um, but, you know, I suppose it's it's a little bit selfish, you'd say, of right to say, well, we're just going to own it all. Um, and if you don't want to play our comps, so be it, but good luck to you. Mm. Um, there's not going to be much else out there now. So all of a sudden, uh, Riot's now got this huge system in place that um, caters for two seasons a year, if I'm... Uh, right. you get Is that correct? Three? three splits. Three splits. Three splits yeah. Sorry, three seasons a year, which spread out quite nicely. I think they get a month or two between each. Yeah. yeah so you're looking at you get split one, then you look at mid-season invitational and Rift Rivals coming through, which provides an off-season for anyone that's not competing. Yeah. Rift even... Rivals is like the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen, <laughs> with one player using the mouse and another player using the keyboard. <laughs> Let's not get into that. <laughs> okay. yeah, but. Uh, is it right they promote this? Yes. Yeah. So Riot basically. So you can see that they make some good moves and bad moves, but um, <laughs> but I think definitely one of their good moves is being able to spread their seasons out really nicely, and as I suppose you know, sort of monopolising their market to their game. It's not really a monopoly if they've made it, but I suppose it's essentially a, a monopoly. Is that they also get to 
listen to the players directly and if the players say this is too much they would just reduce it and mm. you know they've obviously met a, a really good even ground now that it works really well for the players it works well for the guys that are running the productions it works well for the right staff because obviously they don't want to be working 12 months of the year they want to have some time off as well except for rusty that guy doesn't stop <laughs> no he doesn't the poor guy <laughs> poor fella <laughs> the sudokist of uh, of lol by the sounds of it oh yeah <laughs> But yeah, look, I mean, obviously in CS, it's a, it's a whole other dilemma. Um, you've got every tournament organiser under the sun wanting to run a CS GO comp, which then means that, and Valve's participation, no unknowing um, fact is that they've only got, you know, X amount of participation in CS GO. They used to have a bit more presence, was it four, year, four majors a year at one mm -hmm. point, um, which was great, and that would have probably helped space things out a bit better if we still had four majors a year now. Um, but because it's now two majors a year, you're sort of like, well, we need to fill the gaps in between. Yeah. Um, because you're not going to just bank on trying to make major once every six months. If you get an invite. <laughs> well, I mean, if you make an invite, then I mean, it's great. But um, yeah. with, with what, two weeks, uh, two weeks notification two, two weeks time? Notice, yeah, look, yeah. The notice wasn't ideal, um, but you take it as it comes. And I mean, that's pretty much the notice you get with any tournament coming up with CSGO. And, I think that's another big detriment is you can't really plan too far ahead for your own personal life. No. If you want to go and take two weeks off and have holidays, I mean, you know, fortunately I did and I was probably on the cusp of doing that around this time of the year until the minor thing came up. So it was, it was pretty fortunate that we got the news before. But I mean, it's, it's exactly that, that epidemic that we're, we're it's, you know, sort of, um, that we're struggling with is that you've got all these tournaments that go on and they've got qualifiers for lands and finals and big big stages and all this stuff and you have to grind through all these leagues and and seasons and in, in hopes of making the big stage but sometimes you pull through and then it's like you, you're basically hitting the reset button at some point at some point so it's it's long and then you know and then you once once you lose one comp the next one sort of pops up and that's also going to take another you know seven weeks of play time um and and obviously like we're really sensitive to wanting to be the best and given the current circumstances of australia being so competitive in the top five um, or you know so close uh, there's everyone's trying to get to every comp right now yeah. so that they can prove that they're the best team in Australia but not also just Australia we know we're competitive enough to now go overseas regularly and beat the teams overseas as well and try and get our foot you know our footprint off in the tier one scene yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's essentially the goal for everyone in, in Australia in, in the current stage so you know it's it's a really tough thing and I suppose you've got to, like with anything, like if you started your own business, you've got to sort of sacrifice a lot of time. Um, you know, my, I'm, I'm speaking from experience of my old man who, you know, ran a massive um, private company in Australia in his time. You know, his first five to ten years of that business was literally sacrificing all his time, not necessarily time with the kids, but, you know, he obviously spent the time where he could with the kids, but during the week I wouldn't see it. Yeah. Um, not that he was sleeping with another woman, but <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not the case. But but, he, um, it, but it was a successful hard. business, so obviously the time you know spent was paid off. Paid off exactly. Absolutely. So good on him. It's the same theory, I suppose. If you want to succeed in anything, is you've got to spend time and you've got to devote yourself to it. And you know, I think that it's okay to wear it for a few years as long as the results start producing themselves. If it's, if you're doing it for two or three years and nothing happens, then You've got to obviously reassess things, and I think with Sadokus position or Sadokus or however everyone pronounces it, but um, he's um, he's in a really tough position because I think there's obviously a, um, a ceiling for these guys um, in terms of their progression in these big corporate companies that they work for, or if they're working on a free agent basis, it's obviously a lot easier because they can manage their workload. Say, I don't want to do this one, I want to do this one, I don't want to do this one, or whatever. But um, he must obviously be employed with either ESL or someone like that. Well, he's done a lot of work everywhere. Um, and in his yeah. interview, he mentions that the problem from a talent perspective is he's always looking to push mm. because in his position, he wants to be the best, uh, just like any player, but he needs to do that for commentary. And to do that and keep pushing, he had this self-pressure that he needed to be doing every event offered to him, mm. that it would be back-to-back -back events because he needs to be the top, he needs to keep going, he needs to have his presence known. Mm -hmm. And it took him a, a little bit, and he mentions this, that he then had to wake up a bit and realise, 
I don't have to do all of these. Mm. Like there's a limit and there's a balance to be struck in that I stay relevant and that I am still at the top tier of my, my career path, but I have a break and yeah, I yeah. rest and I recuperate. And well, I think I mean, it's um, a balance that the teams are trying to strike. I mean, we've spoken to team owners and they say, when's our downtime to rebuild rosters? Like you look at Legacy's roster mm. where they've been trying to rebuild and come back from moving pl players around. Yeah. They don't get an off season to go, okay, let's spend six weeks getting a team in. They do because they're not in CGP this season and mm -hmm. you could argue that. But if you're a team that's but they're pushing- in Zen. Like, yeah, they're in Zen. Yeah, they're in Zen. Yeah. And if you're in a team that's pushing every single season, to compete in everything you can, as is the CSGO ecosystem, mm. you don't get that downtime. And Christmas no. doesn't count. That does not count no. as a rest. No, no, it doesn't. Well, it did for my previous employment, but you know, yeah, <laughs> my boss was bad, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, traveling and, and seeing family and stuff, like I, I don't relax over Christmas. It's a two hour drive to go see one part of the family, another hour drive to go see another. Buying presents the night before Christmas. That's At right. At least you've Rushing. got the, the short drive. I've got You're to go a flight. to Sydney. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So I'm gonna go to France, so it's not that bad for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> really or not folk. that bad. <laughs> yeah, but in winter, so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> At the end of the day, these things will develop. I mean, we keep coming back to this point that esports is young. And even locally, we've got big moves now. Gfinity's coming over for esports titles here. Mm -hmm. The AFL is planning things for esports titles here yeah. and planning competitions. So then, like Rog just pops one out. Uh, Unicorn pops one out. They just sort of yeah. come out of nowhere. I we mean, get this flood, but at the same time, it. I, I hope, and I, I, this could be some wishful thinking, but I think it will balance over time. CS:GO hasn't. It's still hectic, but. There's no reason why things can't change in the future. I think um, as you know, we keep experiencing this exponential growth, especially in CSGO, um, is, you know, we're, I don't know if it's, I mean, the growth over in NA and EU might be slowing down um, mm. respectfully because I mean, it's just blown up so fast and there's got to be a point where it just takes its foot off the accelerator. Um, you know, obviously there's lots of money in there, six figure salaries over most tier one teams. Um, but the, the, what, what's occurring is like you're seeing Australia now starting to see the, the fruits of the crop, but you know, we're only seeing what they saw five years ago. Um, so I think Australia is now starting to step into that path and we're now gonna be able to start feeling that really good feel of six figures and all these great things and being able to pick the tournaments you wanna go to rather than feeling forced to go to the tournaments. Like Australia's not going to a uh, ESL one. Yeah. Um, you know, they decided to go for that Blast Pro Series or whatever it is, um, which is a, a grassroots out of Denmark and obviously with a lot of investor backing as well. Mm. But, you know, it's something that they prefer to do and, it, and I think it would be great for them because it means they get to stay at home. Um, if it runs over a few weeks or a month or two, then it's even more in their favour of being able to just chill out at home and see family and not feel so pressured. And it might also be a bit of a laugh for them, not saying that they wouldn't take that league seriously, but, you know, just given the marketing of the league, you can tell it's a bit more of a relaxed sort of league, even though they're really promoting yeah. as the most competitive teams. Mm. They're really on the Mimi game and, you know, they're, they're having a bit of fun with it. You know, it's nothing yeah. really, um, it's not like ESL where they're like slamming all this competitiveness yeah. into you and like driving you into like being the best and the most fierce competitor. It's, it's really a bit more laid back. So I think they're, they're also in that position now where they're picking and choosing what they want to go to and what they don't want to go to. And, and a lot of teams do that now that, especially the legends in the majors, um, you know, they, they just pick and choose. And yep. obviously we're not really looking at that type of goal just yet, but I mean, you know, hopefully we're getting into a position where there's enough leagues in Australia and then the Premier League sort of stand out and, and we can say, well, we're not going to play the lower tier league because it's just not worth it. Even if it's got a trip to America for a one-off competition for 20k or whatever yeah the experience might be there but we should be at that by the time that we get there to that that point where we're all sort of swimming in money um, <laughs> we should have already been overseas or we should have had something yeah. on home soil where we've been able to compete with the teams that we always found like, you know dream of playing so i think we're sort of going into that phase very sh not very shortly but you know in the coming few years yep let us know what you think is esports growing well enough in our region i think it is i think we all uh, agree on that point um, but uh, again give us your feedback and talk to yeah. us uh, do you think that
players feel a little bit burned out across titles. Let us know uh, in your title as well, Overwatch, League of Legends, whatever it is you play or, or, or you consume. How do you feel about it? Or just burnt out as a streamer. Yeah. Burnt mm. out as a commentator. Applies across the board. I mean, we, we get burnt. Oh, I'm burnt out at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and we still keep coming back. Exactly. <laughs> now, Ferg, this one's a little bit of a touchy subject, yep. and we'll touch it lightly. Um, but you guys uh, over at Tainted have had a bit of a, a rough end of the stick uh, in the last week, we had Zen League happen. Finals came about, and you guys caught the short end of that straw. Tell sure us is. how you felt. Um, look, we were definitely pissed off, would be an understatement. Um, we yep. were furious. For those um, that aren't aware, um, end of Zen League, uh, League play, Tainted Minds had finished second, and then sprung out of nowhere. Uh, ESL argue it otherwise, but there was a gauntlet to be played and fourth versus third, third against Tainted Mines. That was, of course, Greyhound against Tainted. Tainted unfortunately lost that. Uh, arguments we made that you guys, uh, it was sprung up so you guys weren't prepared, you weren't ready for this. Yeah, well, look, I mean, the, the, def the, the argument is, is completely valid because um, I personally spent, you know, 24 to 48 hours before the match grinding out 20 hours a day of preparation for each team we were playing. So. We never came into a game feeling unprepared. We might have dropped a couple of maps and thrown away a couple of maps, but that's naturally our mistakes as opposed to our lack of preparation. Um, also, the demotivating the the, the you know, feature of having to play these guys that we know we'd beaten them in the regular season to then have to replay them in, in a circumstance where not only do we know that we can't, or we have a player that can't make the changed finals days due to a, you know, a clash with other dates that they hadn't been advised on. Because they just ran it straight after, didn't they? Well, like... well, the first change was the PAX event move. Yep. Um, uh, yep. Because of the clash with uh, Zeus Rog and the Miner. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, uh, the second news came literally two days before the final round of, of the season. And um, when I say the final round, like two days before our match uh, against Kings. Um, so obviously the going into the Kings matchup, we sort of told ourselves, well, if we win 2-0, we're automatically in. It doesn't even matter about having to worry about this stupid rule that's come on top of us. So um, we went in hard for that one. And once again, we sort of threw away a match that was ours. We beat them on Mirage, but we, um, we fell short on Overpass, which we definitely had the upper hand in for the majority of the match. And um, so that was obviously disappointing on ourselves. But at the same time, if the rule change hadn't even been applied, it wouldn't have mattered. Um, we were clearly second. There was no head-to-head -head issues with points. Um, yeah, you, had, you had more points. Than more points than the, the third and fourth. So at yeah. the end of the day, it shouldn't have even been a discussion. It, shouldn't have even, it should have been a backup rule if there had been a head-to-head -head issue with points. Yep. Yeah. Um, because of the fact that it's a BO2, it obviously allows more room for head-to-heads being um, irrelevant because of the fact that a lot of people could Splits. be drawing yep. splits. Um, so I understand the rule being there in case of an emergency, but putting it on there and saying, well, here's a wildcard chance for these guys who have literally just sucked all season. Well, not sucked, but just haven't performed as well. And yep. they're getting a second chance, second bite of the apple. And it's like, when does that ever happen? Um, it really doesn't happen. So it's just, it's a complete negligence of power. And I think it's not the first time that ESL do these types of rule changes to favor God knows who or why. Um, you know, it's really just bizarre. And there, um, there has been speculation over the reasoning behind this. Some of the speculation, and, and we can't really talk to the true intentions of ESL, but some of it's like, okay, well, they've had to move finals date because they can't do it at PAX because of all these other issues. And that's screwed a whole heap of plans for PAX. So we have certain executables that we have to meet for the sponsors for Zen. Let's make sure that we stretch this out with a gauntlet run. That's pretty big speculation. Doesn't yeah. really seem sound, but it's something that could have happened. And regardless of that, I feel for you because mm. you come into a season, you play the season out, and then to then have the end of it go just before the final match of league play, go, oh, by the way, guys, get ready for Gauntlet. That's rough. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's also other points on that as well. I mean, like, I'll, I'll just go straight into it. But, you know, Greyhounds, after knowing that they, before the rule changed, knowing that they hadn't called for Zen League finals, made a roster change. So they were not happy with their performance throughout Zen League. 
they remove Prakken mm -hmm. and they start working on their new fifth. Rule change comes in. They're obviously not allowed to use their new fifth. They have to use Prakken because he's the registered player. So all of a sudden these guys are playing with like a player that they're not even going to be competing with in the future. They're playing with no pressure because who cares? Like it's just, it's basically a pug team at yeah, that stage. I think stage. they put out on Twitter, it was like, oh, we're already out of Zen League now. Yeah, and, and then they get a, a second chance. And I mean, like, like I said, I'd understand the rule if there was a three-way tie for the second place. It mm. makes complete sense, but mm. there wasn't. So why should the rule be applied? Um, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, to be honest, it's just standard from ESL these days. It's ESL Australia, not ESL as ESL. Because um, ESL Australia run on their own rule book. Like, literally anything goes um, as, as a custom to them. Just going to throw them under the bus because it's too many times now. Um, so, yeah, look, I mean, extremely upset about it. Feel like it was robbed. Um, and I'm sure Greyhound have the same argument with regards to the minor qualifier. But at the same time, like, you know, we've been getting their number since we've formed our lineup. And in all due respect, we felt like we were a better team than them at the end of the day. So, you know, coming into this gauntlet, not only were we completely demotivated from having dropped the second map against Kings and not just guaranteeing ourselves, it was also the fact that we have to try and justify our second place, even though we're clearly on the second place. And then dropping that as well, when we have a one map advantage, sure, it's, it's, it's our bad. But at the same time, like, I, I don't blame the mental state of the players at that stage. Like, it's just mm. complete demotivation. I was demotivated. They were demotivated. I don't know what to say in that type in that type of position. Yeah. I shouldn't have to be in that type of position to have to tell them, "Don't worry, guys. You know, we'll do better next season." Like it's just a joke. It's an actual joke. So, um, yeah, really, no hats off to ESL at all. And you know, I, there's no more excuses for them if they say, "Oh, you know, they used to use the excuse, oh, it's our first time running this gig or whatever." Fair enough. But it's their second time running the show. They've run plenty of other shows. Um, there's no excuse, none, none whatsoever. So, some strong words, but I, I, I get where you're coming from, Ferg. And yeah. I, I want to thank the viewers that have stuck around. This has been a longer episode this week. Um, <laughs> well, we've, yes. we've stretched on for an extra half hour, and, uh, and we've got plenty more we could talk about. Yeah. There's a lot that's happened, but um, thanks to anyone that's sticking around as well. It's been worth Ferg's insight on a lot of these topics. Um, there's, of course, a lot of other things that are happening in the scene. Uh, Paris Saint Germain have left League of Legends in EU following H2 case uh, thoughts on that. And, and that's something that I want to touch on next week with a, a couple of different things like Immortals uh, and their issues with NALCS. Yeah, we There's thought that was the lot. nicer structure and that might not be the case. No, but at the end of the day, there, there's always something going on in esports and that's why we're here is to try and cover that. Ferg, I want to thank you so much for joining us thank on the show this gents. week. It's been great to have that's your insight good. across not just stuff in CS, but also esports globally. Uh, again, a big thanks to t for coming on and, and talking shit with me again this week. It's been yeah. good. Uh, and thank you to all of you that are watching, whether you're watching this live right now, whether you're on the VOD or listening to us on SoundCloud later. Also have to thank our amazing in-studio viewer. Thank you, Zumbot, for being here. You're a legend. <laughs> yeah. Talk about that pressure from having an audience at LAN. Oh, Jesus, crazy. <laughs> Damn. But, uh, yeah, we've still, we still got one little piece of content we can we do. Uh, finish it up with. Um, and then announcing our giveaway winner as well. It is. Oh, yes, the giveaway winner. That'll, we'll there announce we that after your so e-gaming award. Yeah, don't go away just yet. It was, thanks, but don't go away just yet. No. So we'll start off with everyone's favourite. The e-gaming e award. award. Uh, How prestigious is that trophy, Ferg? Pretty, <laughs> <laughs> what is this meme? <laughs> <laughs> so for the people unaware... Now, uh, this is the, the E hyphen gaming award. Capital G. Yeah, capital G. This goes out to sort of the biggest esports sort of fail, blunder, or funny thing uh, throughout the week. So, uh, the first recipient was uh, Nielsen Polls. Uh, they got it because they ranked the top esport on television as Candy Crush. Which was a CBS, uh, not a CBS, but a, it was a CBS. It's like a game show. It was a game oh, show yeah. hosted by, yeah. uh, in, in the US. Horrible, yeah. horrible. Uh, this is more on the funny side. Yes. Uh, so we do have a, we've got a nice little video here to, to set it up. We do. Uh, if, yeah, if we can. If we can get our video on. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. So, yeah, okay. oh, here's the oh, replay. Uh, it's, uh, it? Yo, the well, we have the go. fighting game player, Takedo. And he's using the tape measure to see how far his face is from the screen. You need that optimal viewing distance, right? Now, Don't have you hurt done your that eyes. in CSGO yet? 
No. <laughs> Ferg, you don't sit there at, at, at no. Nats and, and pull the tape measure out just to make sure you're sitting at the right no. distance? No. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that's been out for a while, but right now you can actually enter a giveaway to win a That Player branded tape measure. So there are 25 winners of this giveaway from Echo Fox, Taquito being the player for that. As you can see on, on the screen, it's Taquito tape. <laughs> They're giving away 25 units of this. Yeah, uh, it's, it's beautiful. What it a is, meme. It is it's phenomenal, phenomenal, but it's a bit ridiculous. So they'll get the <laughs> gaming award. But um, yeah, we do have a tape measure that you can uh, give to your players up there. Excellent. Um, while they're in the studio boot camping and they can uh, test how far their uh, noses are away from the, the screen. Just, <laughs> it might help out. Yeah. yeah. Need it for that optimal uh, performance viewing. <laughs> uh, but of course, we have been running a massive AOC monitor giveaway on our socials. Thank you to everyone that participated, especially all the random bots that love to retweet things. It was great to get your impressions. <laughs> but we do have an actual winner for the giveaway uh, at MonkeyFist01 on Twitter. Sam Royals, thank you so much for entering. Your 450 something entry out of the 1500 entries mm. that were available has won this monitor. So we'll make sure we get that sent out to you as well as I still owe Genome a, a really dirty mug to give away you, from. Yeah, you said that mug specifically. Yeah, so, he so gets that once I've finished my drink, uh, we might mail that out to Genome. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say as well, I love that hat as a, a shark yeah. supporter. Thank yeah, that's a, that's a great hat. Yeah. Yeah. We might touch that on la later. But that's it from us tonight. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us here at the eSports show. My name's Judge, that's T-Ball. Ferg's been here with us and Sunbot's sitting on a really comfortable chair watching. Uh, we'll see you next week for episode six.